Welcome to the Underbelly Podcast, brought to you by Clarity Financial. As we peek underneath, poke around, and expose the unexposed stories of the week about finance, economics, politics, and life. I'm Brent Clanton, executive producer of The Lance Roberts Show and The Real Investment Hour. We wanted to create a forum for exchanging stories, ideas, and anecdotes that deserve more in-depth, unfiltered conversations, plus allow you a glimpse behind the scenes. As always, we welcome your feedback. Find us on Facebook or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Now, let's step inside the studio for the Underbelly Podcast, starting now. And good afternoon. Welcome. I am Brent Clanton, along with Richard Rosso, John Camerianos, and our special in-studio guest, Darby Douglas, is Ooh, joining us today. I heard he was going to be here. I yeah. haven't seen him yet. Well, we'll let you know when he gets here. <laughs> <laughs> it's been quite a week, and I think we'd like to start off just talking about this bull market extension that we're continuing to experience. Rich and John, what, what do you have to say about all that? So the Dow is up as we speak, about 135 points, half a percent. NASDAQ's up even more, almost 60 points or three quarters of percent. And the S&P 500 up about 0.6%. So the rally continues. Uh, U.S. markets, uh, the S&P 500 is up about eight and a half, nine percent for the year now. Uh, small caps are up about 11% for the year. Foreign stocks still in the doldrums, especially if you don't have a currency hedge. Uh, REITs are back up a couple of points, and bonds now are almost back to being flat for the year after being down two. So that's uh, that's how we stand. That bull's running. Yeah. It really uh, is. Yeah. It's and fun it, to watch. It seems that nothing can deter from the, from the course. You were talking about uh, Mr. Powell making some comments earlier today. Yeah, he, you know, pretty much he's going to stick to gradual rate hikes, but uh, he was clear. If, if for some reason inflation heated up, and obviously we're going to have to watch labor unit uh, costs, unit labor costs very carefully, that he would increase mm -hmm. the pace. Uh, and I can absolutely see him doing that. Uh, I have no qualms about that. And we've seen rate hikes, or the fear of rate hikes, let's say, cause two problems this year. The first That's one right. was the way the market sputtered back in February and March. I think that was clear that it was a response to the fear of rate hikes. The 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 ten year Treasury had touched three or was about to touch three at that point. Um, and then the second thing is emerging markets troubles, which have um, come become prominent now in the summer. Uh, emerging market stocks uh, are down, I think, twenty percent now off of their peak. So that's a, that's a bear market. That's the definition of a bear market. That's right. And a lot of that, we should say they're not down that much in, lo, in their own currency, in local currency. But if you're a U.S. investor, you don't have a currency hedge, you're, you're down 20% from your peak um, a couple of months ago. And that's because um, emerging markets countries and companies based in them have debt denominated in U.S. dollars. As U.S. rates go up, the dollar appreciates, and all of a sudden these countries and these companies have to pay back dollar-denominated debt, which becomes very difficult for them at a certain point. And there have been a lot of people, in, including our own Jesse Colombo, talking about something is going to pop. Something's got to bust loose. What's it going to be? We Poor don't Jesse. know. But Poor we... Jesse's been waiting for something to pop <laughs> <laughs> for so long. Um I think the buttons on the front of his shirt are starting to pop, yeah. though. No, no Texas that's, that's, that's my shirt. <laughs> oh, that's, well, but Jesse's right. I mean, when, and John will attest to this, when we see rates start to go higher, one, we start to pull liquidity out of the markets, and these markets have been driven by liquidity. I mean, that has been a fundamental foundation of what's driven this market higher has been lower interest rates and unorthodox monetary policy. Right, John? Mm -hmm. I think I agree. And I think um, there are a number of candidates that could be the cause of, a, of, a, of the next meltdown. My leading candidate, uh, my best guess is that it's corporate debt. Mm -hmm. Corporations, and you, gotta, you have to understand they have a lot of incentive to borrow when interest rates are that low. Well, sure. It's cheap it's, money. It's cheap money. It's like anyone else who, who goes out to borrow money and, and can get it for almost free. So they have a lot of incentive to do it. All of a sudden, the balance sheets of U.S. companies are loaded up with debt now, and if rates do go up, 
they're going to some companies certainly going to have a hard time paying paying the debt back or servicing the debt and rolling it when it has to be rolled. So that's my leading candidate, but it hasn't happened yet. So we have to see we all do not know the level of pain that will be required because as rates go up and liquidity dries up and borrowing costs increase, what you start to see are cracks yeah. in the foundation. Yeah. We don't know where those cracks are. I agree with John that obviously corporate the corporate balance sheets would be an issue well, so let's, uh, let's, overall. Let's play what if and follow that premise sure. to maybe its logical conclusion. So a corporation suddenly has its debt called yeah. and instead of allowing them to renegotiate the terms of that debt, mm -hmm. the bank says, uh-uh, you got to pay up. Well, we can't. Right. That's one. That's certainly one scenario. They can't roll the debt. They, they can't it's, roll. It's and, called. And, and with, obviously, junk bond, I mean, co corporations sort of on the edge mm -hmm. would have an issue. So investment-grade bonds now, 50%, the cutoff, we should say, for investment-grade bonds is triple B. Anything below triple B is junk. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a record number of investment-grade bonds, so triple A to triple B, that range, in the triple B range, in the lowest rung now before they get to junk, half the investment grade market is now on that last rung before it gets really? to junk. I think it's the first time in history that mm -hmm. much of the investment grade bond market has been that low in investment grade. And so. you have people chasing yields still in, in junk and mm -hmm. not realizing what could happen if rates increase. They are taking tremendous risk yeah. for yields that they're getting. I mean, for the risk they're taking, they should be getting double digit yields and they're getting 5% yeah. on it. Oh, for the most part, no reason to take the risk. You know what's, you know what's sort of uh, confuses me, John? GE bonds yeah. have not down, been downgraded. Oh, that's interesting. I see the them trouble. at A2 and, and they're still holding up in price. And mm -hmm. I don't understand that with all that GE's going on gone on with GE and if you look at their free cash flow I don't I don't understand yeah. why there hasn't been even at least a deterioration it's a good question price. it's a good question especially with all the real estate they own and all the maybe that's it the yeah. bond investors are looking at the actual underlying assets saying hey uh they can liquidate I, I or mean, there's, what there's I, a couple I, of ways to look at it you could they could you could look at the real estate and derive confidence from that mm -hmm. because real estate prices are high or the, you could yeah. say there are shakier assets here underlying th this debt. So I, I guess right now the market is taking the first uh, view okay. of things. Well, could it be, too, be because they're so widely diversified across a lot of different places? They are, yeah. That there's not any one weak point that'll drag down everybody else. That's probably to GE's benefit yeah. as well. It is obviously a well, a, a more well-diversified company. It's a conglomerate, of course. Uh, so Yeah. Yeah, very well could be. But I do agree. And listen... Uh, people are forgetting not only bear markets, but just garden variety, so-called garden variety corrections. Yeah, yeah. What you have to worry about is how investors are going to react once markets turn. Because as we see a bull run, we can see a bear run. Okay. Yeah. As mm -hmm. this thing stampedes, it can stampede on the other side. And I wonder how many investors are going to react and advisors, especially those who have never seen a down cycle, a correction, a bear market. Well, you have a whole that. generation of advisors who've never witnessed that. Yeah. You yeah. Know? A lot of people in the financial services industry who have yeah. not. The other thing I would say about the, the crisis in, fin in 2008 and 2009, as, as traumatic as it was and as painful as it was, it was relatively quick. By March 2009, mm -hmm. the stock market bottomed and it was over in terms of the stock market. I think the recession lasted a little longer and high yeah. unemployment levels lasted a little longer. But the pain in the markets were over relatively quickly. People forget it, from 2000 to 2002 when the tech bubble melted down, that was a three-year bloodletting. That was a little bit different. And that's usually the way they are. They're not usually as quick as the way it was in 08 and 09. So what do you think the delta is going to be this time? I'm, I'm, I would bet on longer. I would bet on, on more like 2000, 2002. Um, you know, we're starting to see cracks in residential housing now. And I don't know if residential housing is a bubble. I think Jesse thinks it is. I'm not worried about it as much as I was in 08 because there's not there hasn't been the crazy lending in residential housing. Well, the they're other, starting to though, but it, yeah. there hasn't been. There hasn't been. But what the, yeah. what the problem is if you, you can fog a mirror, you, you get a loan. But you're starting to price the most pr families out. The, that's um, the thing, and sales have been down now right. multiple months in a row. Um, just the amount of just the amount of sales, especially. Um, 
Well, uh, really all over the country, I That's think. That's right. Yeah. I, know, I know my daughter and her husband, they just bought a house up in Spring. Yeah. And, well, they paid way more money for their house than I paid for mine 15 yeah. years ago. That's the Exxon effect. And getting half half the house. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And then interest rates are much higher. My yeah. interest rate is like three and seven eighths. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're paying like five and a half now. I'm right there yes. with you. Whoa. Yeah. So there's going to the be thing. a point of pain on interest rates, too, that people go, I can't. I yeah. Can't yeah. People are priced it. out now, I think. Yeah. I but, mean, it's not like the 80s when interest rates were like 14% on a home. Right. I remember that. <laughs> I do, too. And well, nobody could afford to buy a house just because the interest rate was so yeah. high. But yeah. they did. Oh, you yeah. know, we, we figured out a way to, to yeah. get it done. Well, yeah, the price of a house was a lot lower. Yeah. That's, That's true. It was. Yeah. That's true. So the mortgage companies and, and the lenders are going to say, hey, we're not making enough loans yeah. anymore, so we got to change the parameters, and and that's where it's going to go. Either either that will get you'll get stupid lending again. Either that will happen, or the price of the house will go down. Yeah, um, to, to I don't see that happening around here. Yeah, maybe not. But overall, there's been weakness across mm -hmm. the country. Yeah, for the last few months, so it's definitely something to watch. Yeah. So corporate debt or mortgage lending huh? mortgage lending yeah but i'm i bet a little bit more on corporate debt and then and then the corollary to that is whether powell continues his rate hike regime which will uh which will hurt yeah emerging markets our markets stocks will get repriced at some point that's the thing yeah okay so even forget corp just the economy side but on the stock market side and sometimes the economy and the market are not the same okay mm -hmm. i can show you times when people were living in tents yeah. During the depression, and the market's up 135 okay? percent. Right, right. It's the fact that the market loves low interest rates, and then and there's going to have to be a repricing if as rates increase. Yeah. But those rates are artificial. In in fact, a lot of people. You know, I've got a, I've got a couple of quotes I want to share with you today. Sure. Uh, Gluston Chef, Chief Economist David Rosenberg, yep. is talking about these the cracks in the longest bull market. Mm -hmm. And the, he cites the, the boost that stock and credit markets have gotten from central banks around the world, mm -hmm. predicting that it could all come crumbling down as these easy money policies fade. And he was talking on CNBC. I got I to gotta give them credit for the audio here. Keep in context how um, weird it is to have the longest bull market, as you say, in equities in the context of the weakest economic expansion of all time. And how do you square that circle is because of the long arm of the central banks, not just central mm -hmm. banks, but also sovereign wealth funds. It just doesn't make sense any other way. Right. Right. And, and we always say that that is one of the pillars, right? The unorthodox monetary policy, the mm -hmm. lower for longer interest rates. I could also contend that we haven't had this huge boom in activity. It's sort of been at a low boil, Very so tepid. there's been nothing yeah. to bust. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I had a theory that I thought we, we, we would see is more Japan-like, where we would, mm -hmm. the frequency of recessions would pick up, but they would be smoother. smoother they, would be, yeah. they wouldn't be as, as violent, as violent yeah. and it would ha they would happen more often. Yeah. So that hasn't even happened. Yeah. And we've had no wage growth up until very recently. That's the other. Oh, until very other. recently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. For the whole, really the whole 10-year, 9-year period. That starts to continue to move. And again, and Powell continues to move, I think market pays a lot of attention. Yeah. And to, to John's point, the repricing could be painful. Yeah. Well, the, and uh, the thing about the raising the interest rates uh, by the Fed, it, it, it's, and this has been told before, it's like trying to pilot a hot air balloon. Yeah. You give it some, some gas and you increase the heat in that thing, but you have no idea how far right. beyond... It's going to give you that, that lift. Yeah. You know, it's very imprecise. If, very. If, if advisors were doing their jobs during the tech bubble, it was a non-event for many investors. Mm -hmm. And I'm taking that from my own experience, where I was seeing that everything was in tech and that sector was going to blow. All I had to do was reallocate if people were willing to sell. And I remember I lost quite a few people who walked out of the office saying, uh, why should I sell my tech stocks and buy these 9% bonds you're telling me? Because this, when we used to show a graph of where tech was compared to the S&P 500. I said, this cannot last. That's the thing. You have to be willing this to let clients walk last. out. And they walked out. Some yeah. walked out. And I said, well, I'm sorry. But every, well, this is a new thing, new paradigm. <laughs> I, can say, I can show you when radio, and I used radio stocks because I was studying the depression and showing how radio stocks just took off. Yeah. It was the newest big thing. And then... 
they collapsed because it's yeah. been accepted. It's, mm -hmm. And I said, when companies like eToys came out, and I don't even think that's a company, I'm like, you guys are nuts <laughs> buying this stuff. Yeah. I'm sorry, but why don't you just buy like Procter & Gamble and some 9% bonds and take your profits? And the people who did listen, some of them are here with me today. Yeah. It's an interesting story from the mutual fund world from that time. There's a really good fund called the FPA, First Pacific Advisors Crescent Fund. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so this fund in the late 90s, Steve Romick is their long-time manager. I got to say manager. one thing about John, though. He dusts off all my memories of all these funds that I forgot. <laughs> I went, oh, yeah, I remember that fund. But this fund, uh, this, this manager, Steve Romick, he said, wow. yeah, I'm not buying any tech stocks anymore. This is insane. And so in 1998, that fund was sort of hunkered down in small cap stocks and cash, very unsexy tech uh, non-tech businesses. And for that two-year period, the S&P 500 was up 55%. FPA Crescent was flat or down a, just a couple of percentage points. They lost 90% of their investors. Mm -hmm. Whoa. They just walked yeah. out the door. Uh -huh. And the fund didn't do terribly. It just mm -hmm. lost a couple of percentage points, but it didn't keep up with the market at all. But of course, 2000 rolls around and the fund was poised to do much better. And people just couldn't be patient and wait. You see, as, if this continues... And the fear of missing out starts to really take over. And Main Street really starts to forget, because now they still remember, and many households still haven't recovered from the Great Recession. We're going to go through a cycle like this again. Yeah, I don't know what it'll be, but it'll just maybe be, because I call this the everything bubble. Mm -hmm. It just could be the stock market in general. Yeah. And that's, we're not there yet, but it, we're going to get close. Yeah. yeah, People are going to start to reshift their allocations. They've been conservative for so long. I had clients today, dear clients of mine that are retired and they don't want to take much risk that they're going, and I have them in 37% in equities and they go, don't you think we should have a little more? And I'm like, no, we should not. <laughs> but I'm saying these are people that are hardcore, do not want to lose money, sure. but they're willing because their stock portion of their portfolio is up 16% over the last 12 months. I, and I said, listen, I get it. But I also help you understand is if we lose quite a bit of money here, it's not good for you as retirees. So you, as an advisor, are going to have to stand their ground as best they can as this thing continues to run. And, and, really, and that's going to be a challenge. The reminder is the preservation of principle. Mm -hmm. And you, you, <laughs> you totally leave that stuff hanging out there, yeah. exposed. And this is the real issue. There's that there are conflicting emotions in investing. They want to be conservative. Oh, but that's the problem. That's, emotion. That's the real problem. Yeah. You, have, you have these conflicting emotions. And so they want to be Aren't conservative. Aren't there any nice conservative stocks? But the, mar but the market's <laughs> running, and we're missing out. Yeah, right. I, I, need a, I need a conservative stock that earns me 40% a right, year. Right, right, right. That's what I need. Exactly. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> I want all the gains and none of the losses. That's right. <laughs> the, I, the strange thing is stocks are starting to feel safe. Yeah. Really? And I'm bit, well, just, I'm just, I mean, just yeah. looking at yeah, it yeah. like every day. Yeah, the conservative clients want more stocks. The, the bad yeah. news doesn't really affect it. The mm -hmm. good news takes it much higher, and you go, what the hell? Well, like we were talking before we went on the air, Powell said what he said. No big deal. <laughs> no big deal. I yeah. mean, markets off its higher bit, but nothing compared to what it should have been mm -hmm. uh, overall. Listen, uh, we started to gain traction. Ken Rogoff, best one of the books this time is different. Uh, when, he's, when they're looking at uh, debt across the globe for years, and they say, listen, Rogoff, and they don't talk about Rogoff enough, but he says in that book, which is one of the best books I ever read on over indebtedness of, of sovereigns, but he talks about, listen, it takes about 10 years to fully come out of a financial banking housing crisis. And if I, darn right, he was absolutely correct. Yeah. And then throw in some animal spirits, things start to gain traction. I'm starting to drink more coffee, and then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get myself a, a, a double espresso with a espresso chaser. Right. Well, and, and hold that thought. Ten years. Let's talk about ten years. I don't want to talk old about I my am. hairline. Well, what? where where will we be in ten years? Yeah. Uh, well, I can't. I, you know, I, I, I think I just, I'll be. I a, just hope I'm still alive. Yeah. Well, that's my point. You know, well, for, I ch I was telling. I don't tell Darby my light bulb story. Yeah. Like, you know, they buy 20, they, have, they go, oh, like, this light bulb's going to last 20 years. years. And I'm like, I put this, I said, this might be the very last freaking time I'm I changing did this the bulb. the same thing. Did you? Because in my garage. I don't hate it. In my garage, uh, you know, it vibrates, so the bulbs go out all the time. Right. So I went and bought LED 22 years. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm putting yeah. that thing in, I'm going, 
I don't ever have to do this again. Yeah. I'll be dead. Yeah, Listen, you put your I, initials I, on it. Is it nice to know I'm not the only one thinking like this? Yeah. <laughs> I thought the same okay. thing. Light bulbs I have my and back green bananas. Light. 22 years, I'm going, I'll be dead. Yeah. <laughs> and I, at the time, that's I'll be when, dead bulbs. That's when the yeah, LEDs were like $20 a pop. Yeah. They've gotten cheap now. That's right. I'm going like, well, it's worth 20 bucks to never have to change that again. Oh, yeah. I'm all good with I've that. I've done that mental math. Mm -hmm. Should I spend more and not ever have to do Listen, it Listen, when you start buying bread at the store going, I don't know if I'm going to last before this gets moldy, <laughs> then you know we got to But it's going to happen when yeah. you're going to start doing that, too. That and green bananas. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this has gotten this took, a, this took a depressing turn, but at least Darby, we're here. thinking all, we're all, we're we're in some here well, it, with the light bulb. It's a nice place to morph over into. You the think next the, topic. my little old lady next door? My when I when I when I changed the bulb and I went <laughs> like this was my last time to change the bulb. She thought that was weird. Exercise the filaments. Uh, right. <laughs> So our special guest on today's Underbelly Podcast is the handsome, highly regarded Darby Douglas. Did I get it? Yeah. Is it just my hair? Yeah. <laughs> His hair could talk. It, exactly. It does. <laughs> so we've wanted to have you on for quite some time. You've, yeah, you've, we've been working on that. Yeah, we have. Mm -hmm. I'm finally here. Happy to see you back among the living. It's good to be alive. Yeah. Although I will say uh, I had a really bad case of... One word, diverticulitis. Oh, my God. Say goodness. that three Ooh, times real fast. Yeah. That is, uh, I wouldn't envy anybody. I know mm, how painful that can be. Wouldn't wish that on anyone. It's the mo I won't say it's the most pain I've ever been in, but it's the most uncomfortable pain yeah. I've been in because it lasted like two months. Besides Ooh. marriage, you mean? Well, I'm married to an Italian, he's, so he's I, gotta, got a I great have to wife. say my marriage is great. Yeah, yeah you do because yeah. you'll die. That's right. <laughs> yeah. He, you won't wake up. Uncle Frank the... will come visit. <laughs> Let me tell you, you won't outlive. You won't outlive that bulb no. you replace. <laughs> I just celebrated my 26th anniversary. Congratulations! Yeah. Congratulations. So Nicely she's, done. She's put up with me for 26 years. Yeah. And you know what? Italian women don't really age. No, nope, she looks nope. the same to me. That's what I'm telling you. My daughter-in-law is Italian. They she's don't. They're, they gorgeous. stay like young forever. <laughs> yeah. I did do that on purpose. I think they're vampires. <laughs> <laughs> I have no comment on that. <laughs> not going to go there. I'm trying to get Darby to kick in, but he's no, like, no, 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 no. I just, I, the, That's what we call radio silence. Uncle Frank, he, he said it. It wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle so, Tony, it wasn't. A year ago, yeah. this weekend, we were, most of us, you weren't, because you weren't here, John. Right. Most of us were sloshing around in floodwaters oh, from Hurricane wow. Harvey. And you were oh, yeah. one of the media that was helping us keep track of the storm and everything that was going on. Uh, you know, because I lived through, well, I'm a native Houstonian, so I've been here forever. <clears throat> but uh, I lived through Allison back yeah. in 2001. And uh, and that's always been the benchmark, right? Darby? Like, oh, it like for any storm. Right, pretty Allison much. I think was, Angleton had a got had a sh uh, storm one time, a tropical storm that dropped like forty two inches of rain mm -hmm. oh, down wow. in Angleton okay. in like one night. And so, hey. but it's all pasture out there. Mm -hmm. When Allison came through, <clears throat> excuse me, downtown got like twenty eight inches oh, yeah. of rain just yeah. inside the loop, and then over to the northeast got like thirty two inches of rain, basically in like a week. The Southwest Freeway became the Lloyd Benson River. Yep. I got stuck <laughs> in it. We, I lost my vehicle and uh, had to figure out how to get back into the station. Mm -hmm. In the close, I was, I'd was i been doing a, a station event, a celebrity event. Yeah. Like, it was a, like I was a waiter. Oh, those, a, yeah. Celebrity waiter, mm -hmm. which was great. Well fed. We came out at midnight. <laughs> and, and, you know, the sky was falling, literally. Literally. Uh, and uh, tried to get home to our kids out here in Katy. And made it to about T.C. Jester in I-10. And oh. we come up to where it drops down underneath. Yep. You could see the water coming up at you. Mm -hmm. Yikes. So backed up, went up the entrance exit ramp or entrance ramp from T.C. Jester. Got on T.C. Jester, ended up getting flooded out. Yeah. And so we're flooded out. And I go, I want to push the car up to higher ground here. And I'll call somebody, see if we can come get us. As soon as I opened the door, it was, it was so cold. And it wasn't rain. It was like somebody just taking a bucket and pouring it on you. So as soon as I opened the door, I was completely soaked. And I guarantee I gained 40 pounds in one second just from water. Mm -hmm. oh my God, I just went, oh. And I was completely soaked, got out, pushed the car to higher ground. Uh, fortunately, a friend of mine, uh, Nick Scaffey, God rest his soul, mm -hmm. came and pulled me out, took us to, took uh, my wife and I to his house. And then he drove us to the station the next morning. And then I was on the air for like two days. Wow. In clothes that I've been wearing for two days straight. It was yeah. rough. And that was Allison. Then here comes Harvey. Uh, 
42 inches basically for the entire county. God. I mean, I think if you go countywide, it was uh, just under three feet of rain fell in the entire Harris County. And this time, you lost your TV station. Yep. We went completely under. Yes. Fortunately, I was not there for that because <laughs> so, so I'm there and it's, I'm guessing, Friday night. Yeah. And David Paul says, well, it's not, there's not going to be any more heavy rain until tomorrow. So you guys go on home. So we went home. And then, the rains, and then the rains came and mm -hmm. they got flooded out. Yeah. And then we had to try and figure out how to get over to Channel 8 to where, uh, where we set up shop there. I ended up having to go. Me and uh, Russ Lewis got in his uh, Suburban, mm -hmm. or I think in a Tahoe. And we drove Beltway South, trying to get in off Cullen. Couldn't do it. Ended up talking to a sheriff. He said, might try 98, South Main. Yeah. So we ended up taking South Main. We got there. And man, you talk about scary. That was some scary stuff. And then I was at the station for like three days straight, sleeping. At Channel 8. At Channel 8. Now, yeah. the good news is at Channel 8, they've got a shower. Did you know that? No, I did not. Yes. There's a shower. Oh, you know, they did down have. Down the hall from the, from the TV studio. Yeah, if you go into the bathrooms, they have, they yes. have a connecting shower. So, yeah, I did use it once. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, I smell good. Okay. I'm sure, I'm yeah. sure it smelled really good. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> but then, you know, we lost everything. So, I'm doing everything off my phone. I'm going to go Google Maps and doing all my phone, doing all my research there, and just standing there on camera looking at my phone going, okay, so, so and so needs to get here. Well, all right, well, when I'm looking at here, you could go this way, that way, and I would just give alternate routes that way. It There's was, no B roll. No, it was. And I hadn't shaved because I didn't have, I didn't have makeup. My makeup got flooded. Everything, I've lost everything. So I got beard tell, work. Tell me about that. I mean, how much makeup do you guys have to wear on television? A lot. Really? Yeah. Is it because of the HD lenses now? Well, no. I mean, they when we got HD, they they had camera makeup people come in and tell us how to do HD makeup. Yeah. I never did that. And, <laughs> but it's basically the lights are so bright in the yeah. studios. They're so bright that you can see every pore. We keep it dim in here for a reason. But yeah. you would think every that flaw. all that lighting would actually blast you younger. Well, like it's like yeah. if you have makeup on it will because if you don't what happens is you have a beard and it'll show every it'll absorb yeah. that light and bounces back anything white bounces uh, back i don't but like to look at myself dark, on tv so i don't think dark it absorbs so anything yeah. so i have this birthmark here this would come in dark purple <laughs> really <laughs> my beard i could just shave it would just look black so what you do is you put on studio makeup which is yeah. thicker it's almost like clay yeah it is and hard to wash them so when the light hits it it diffuses mm -hmm. so really yeah you just look like a normal human being <laughs> and the ladies have to wear a lot they, they do wear a lot but i will say this i worked with cheetah craft and uh lisa hernandez mm -hmm. with or without makeup oh, they're still yep. beautiful mm -hmm. well, we've had uh, lily Zhang come up in here a couple of times there's a beautiful lady there just naturally Love gorgeous you, lily yeah, yeah she is. Lily doesn't need any makeup. It's none, amazing. None whatsoever. She is amazing. And I wish I wish she could bottle whatever it is that she runs on, because she's like the Energizer Bunny or something. Now there's no off. And you want to see her. her really run fast to go. Hey, when are we getting together, Lily? <laughs> when are we going for dinner? When are we? Zing! <laughs> <Ding, gotta> go! <laughs> it's <laughs> that's her. I worked with her for a couple of years, man. It was great. <laughs> Darby. That's what she, <laughs> I could hear her saying that. Dabby! Yeah. yeah. Dabby! Yeah. She's just full of energy. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, it had to be pretty amazing to work at the station. Well, even Sophia from Channel 2. I mean, all those guys there, too. I mean, everybody. I think, I think the news people here, I think the report, I think everybody in the news did incredible here. I mean, I was. Who was the woman that was I, stuck on Beltway 8 and she helped? Get this truck oh, driver yes. out of this truck. Uh, Brandy Smith. Brandy yeah. Smith yes. got an award Brandy. for that. That's yes, right. She did. I remember that. And, watched uh, that. I watched that live. Yeah, me too. And I'm getting like goosebumps wow. watching this thing unfold. Uh huh. And she basically was carrying the station because you guys were having to bug out, and that was the only live link. <laughs> That was feeding anything at all oh, to yeah, the we, had, we had really gone back to 1950s television because <laughs> we lost it all. And they had, they had already had something in place in case something happened yeah. for us to go there. But it was really just basic Stone Age stuff. Mm -hmm. We could just go push a button, go to that, and that's it, and then come back and just have to talk. And what a lot of people don't realize is now you're still in the uh, Houston Public Media Facilities one aspect of it is there's another aspect that is in this building down on the third floor and if i'm not mistaken uh central control is somewhere up in dallas is that correct 
I don't know if we're still. I don't know if they're still doing central control. I think they finally moved control back down to Houston. Oh, okay. I think they finally. But for did a that. while, oh. Channel Eleven was running on remote control. Oh no, it was horrible for a while there. We couldn't even have earpieces in to listen to what was going on. No because, IFB. Because if you talked, it came back to you about a half a second later. Yeah. Or a second later, because mm -hmm. not only did it have to shoot out to Senior Road, then it had to shoot up to Dallas, back out to Senior Road, and back in. And the time lag was horrible. So yeah. doing interviews, you ask somebody a question that's not in the room, you had to wait like two seconds for them to hear it and then answer it. It was another two seconds. It made it, it made Senior it Road is where all of the television and FM radio antennas are located in Houston. Yeah, down, down there off of Senior Road Tower Fort and Bend uh, Fort Bend County yeah. and the Fort Bend Toll Road. You'll see they call it all an those antenna big antennas. Farm. That's where everybody does all their business. It's just amazing. It is. It really is. So we're, we went off track, didn't we? I, uh, I started well, just going on. That's, fine. that's why you're here. Yeah. <laughs> now, I was going to ask the experts here. Uh-oh. Um, so we've been on pretty much on a bull market since, what, 2010? Yeah, nine, really. Nine. 2000, okay, so 2009 yeah. when it bottomed out, mm -hmm. yeah. and it's just been running. I mean, my money has made so much money in yeah. the last nine years. It's just unreal. I see know how it, fast you lose it? I know it's coming <laughs> to an end. Yeah. I know. I know. But I'm wondering, with this administration being so business friendly, can, is it going to stretch out longer while we have this administration in? Or is it going to collapse during this administration? What do you guys think? <laughs> it depends how long this administration really lasts. Let's, let's, We've if, had some... if he gets the full eight years, yeah. will it keep running the full eight years? I still think it's the Fed overall yeah. that can squash everything. That You, you see Trump's very vo becoming very vocal mm -hmm. over Powell mm -hmm. now. Because he understands if rates keep going higher, and that's just Powell's just doing his job. It will, it will pull back what you need to. I, I don't know of a time in history where rising interest rates have not caused right. some form of derail. Right. And to me, with all the cheap cash that's been around, um, that can do it. Now, again, it's all based on is it gradual? Is it going to be quick? All I would tell people right now is as markets are higher, if your allocation's out of whack, this is the time for you to actually oh, yeah. reallocate. Well, Re you've I got mean, it to reallocate with. Yeah. What that, was that, that chart? That you, you did a video yesterday, John. Yeah. yeah. And, and one of the charts that you used showed the growth that we've had, and it was exponential. Exponential. So, so since 2009, an investment in the S&P 500 has basically quadrupled. You've, you've made four times your money. That's mind-blowing. I've made six. Yeah, I've made six times my money. Yeah. That is mind-blowing. You've probably been adding to your account, too, but still, uh, yeah. in your 401k. But it's, it's been an incredible uh, run, no question about it. And the other chart I showed was, of course, the Schiller P.E. ratio, yeah. which we yeah. like to show a lot. And that, that's at 32 now, basically double its long-term average. That's the real cause for concern. You're paying a lot for for underlying corporate earnings now. It's like, it's like buying um, a piece of real estate as an investment and you're paying 30 times what the what the annual income is going to be off the rent, and it just doesn't make sense. It may be a great piece of real estate, but not at that price. Paying a, based on yeah. the anticipated value when you sell it. Yeah, yeah, or something like that. Right, yeah. right. No, real estate's way too high in this town. It used to be a bargain here, and then all of a sudden, it's like it's like being in Chicago or yeah. New York. Man, you can't get a piece of property well, without paying way too much. Well, during the housing crisis, when I was doing research for my book that came out in 12, I was looking at booms and busts in housing and studied Miami in the 20s and all these different cities. And I realized what I, when I researched certain area, every area, almost every area of Houston, on an inflation adjusted basis, most had not recovered from the 82 bust. So we didn't have the boom mm -hmm. in the last housing crisis. Really? Yeah. Now, some house prices were on, were, got hurt, but for the most part, not like any other areas of the country. And then over the last, I'd say, four or five years. Yeah. We have started to see Houston really go yeah. into this boom. It's gotten out of hand. Yeah, it really has. I mean, little tiny homes, 1,400 square feet, three stories tall, this wide, mm -hmm. are, you know, $500,000. Yeah. $800,000. Well, inside the loop. Can't even. It's location. Now, you know, my wife, somebody's trying to call me. My wife makes me watch HGTV. Uh huh. <laughs> so I have watched an episode or two of Flipper Flop. Flipper yeah. Flop. Right. And. Man, I, housing prices in California, even after the bust, are oh, still outrageous. No. They're right, right back to where the, the yeah, bubble peak they, was. Right. Yeah. They take a 1,200-square-foot home built in 1940, mm -hmm. gut it, put it back together, 
Seven hundred thousand dollars, and yeah. it's not even downtown Los Angeles. It's in some suburb. And they're all going, "Oh, this is a great price for this house." <laughs> oh, is that what Houston's going to come to? I hope not. You can't build in California, so you can build here. So Houston probably won't okay, come yeah. to that. You yeah. know, it usually <laughs> takes decades for housing busts to recover. You know, the mm-hmm. housing yeah. that housing to to recover, but. This to me has been one of the quickest Fast recoveries in housing I've I've really I, in history. Fast and furious, no doubt. And again, I made me look like an idiot rates. in my book in 2012 because I was like, eh, if if history is any guide, you're yeah. going to be sitting on this for a while. I mean, since the bu- yeah. at the peak of the bubble, we had almost 70 percent home ownership in the country. Then the bust the bust occurs. We come back down to the low 60s, 62, 63. But prices go up. That uh, it's a little strange, right? <laughs> well, I think in the beginning of this, there were Wall Street came in and scooped up. They scooped up the a home. lot of homes. Yeah, yeah, and they're renting them now. And they're renting them yeah. now. Yeah. Matter of fact, there were. I can't remember the name of the firm. Actually, I do, but I want to say, um, after Harvey, I had clients that were getting calls yeah. from this major brokerage firm in mm. New York saying, "Hey, you, we're, we want to buy your house." Oh yeah, the, I, they, we want to buy your. They're pro- going cheap once they're gutted and flooded out. Yeah, you can get them for pennies on the dollar. Right, yeah, they, they were calling people like three days after the storm was over. Mm. Massive campaign. Uh, so I wonder how many homes they managed to pick yeah. up. Yep. So, yeah, because I had thought about that, except I didn't have any cash to do that with. But I thought. <laughs> In some of these nicer neighborhoods down here on the west side that got flooded out by mm-hmm. uh, Attic's Reservoir, mm-hmm. talking five hundred thousand dollar homes that were just completely lost, decimated, mm-hmm. that you could pick up for like one hundred and sixty five thousand mm-hmm. dollars. And I'm thinking, if you've got the money, you go get it, well, put it back together, and just rent it. And you should be able to get reasonable rent for that area, with you know, and you're the one taking on the risk with the homeowner's insurance. But the qu- that's that's, that's the question: Will you even ever be able to insure it ever again? Sure. It'll just be more expensive. Can you afford it, though? Yeah, it'll just be more expensive. Yeah. Well, you get your you get your tenant to pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> and what does that do to rents then? You know? Well, it's already in a nice area, so and yeah. you're getting the you're getting the home so cheap. I would assume that would make up for it. I don't know. This is anecdotal at best, but generally speaking, it seems like when it comes to f- housing mm-hmm. and flooding, the memories here are pretty short. Right away, you're starting to see building again oh, yeah, in areas that well, flooded. We have floods flooded. every year. We have massive floods every year. So, so it's like, like, oh, yeah, another okay, tax day Just flood. used to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go ahead and rebuild. I, mean, I, I don't think I could live through that. Uh, I, I mean, I had no issues up in where we live close, not far from each other. Yeah, you, you didn't have any issues either. None whatsoever. My house is in a high spot in the neighborhood, mm-hmm. with a retention pond right behind it, and our our plat is like 20 feet above the bank of Cypress Creek, which ran out of its banks. Mm-hmm. So we were in great shape. Now, getting to it was a challenge because we had to cross oh, Cypress that's right. Creek then at some point. Yeah. And that was kind of hairy. Yeah, because I live off I-10 and Greenhouse, and Made Creek came out of its banks. Oh, yeah. Everybody went under except my neighborhood. My mm-hmm. neighborhood was fine. So my wow. wife and I got out and we were doing Facebook Lives trying to help people figure out how to get out of the neighborhood or get back into it because it was just completely underwater. So we were supposed to have a company party at Lance Roberts' house. That's right. That Friday night. That's right. Uh And it got called off because of the rain, understandably. And I, I heard from him the next day. Water came within this close. He was, he was lucky. He was sweating bullets, you know, uh, fortunately it didn't flood. Now they had some, some other issues with rain. I'm thinking, imagine if we would have gotten to the party, we would have been staying over Lance's house. That's right. Which I guess there could be worse things happen to us. <laughs> You've seen that power? As, as, as long as he brings in catering, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't do anything halfway. So we'll see. I'd be following Mrs. Roberts around the house. <laughs> Mrs. Roberts, <laughs> can I help you with anything? <laughs> That's the t- this is the point where Lance rolls his eyes. Yes, yeah. the eye roll. The eye roll, yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll say Harvey was that was that was the worst because Allison was really bad, mm-hmm. but this was just as bad as Allison. Only it covered way more area, and my mother basically is just now back in her home and feels like she's at home. Oh, good! She got flooded wow. out, and it was it was a big mess. We were fortunate, so I had to have her living with us for a few months. Mm-hmm. Then I had a daughter come home from college mm-hmm. <laughs> with their dogs, so I had three dogs, <laughs> three people. And then it's they the start, Douglas Menagerie. Yeah, well, then my mom and my sister moved out, and they went into FEMA housing. And uh, from there, then my oldest daughter and her husband 
moved back from Seattle, came in while they're having their house built. So I'm since August 29th, I've had a full full house yeah. until this week. If you charged rent, you'd be a rich man oh, by now. Yeah. yeah, my wife would not have that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about it. <laughs> <sighs> You know, you know those Italian mothers. Oh no, no, we'll give you no, everything no. we got. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Here's that's the right. shirt off my back. <laughs> that's what I love about her. Well, we've missed you being on the air. I've missed being on the air. I do. I do miss it. Uh, been away from it now for what two and a half months. Seems like it's been longer than that. Well, I mean, but when I was down, when I was sick. Yeah, yeah. I didn't pay much attention no to anything. But now that I'm coming back and uh, starting to feel healthier. Mm-hmm. I'm, I, I don't miss getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning. No, I bet, bet But not. Uh, I still get up at 5. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. Whether I want to or not, I just get up. And so I just tool around the house. I've been spending so much time with my grandson that it's, it was hard to miss TV. But now my grandson's gone. Oh, yeah. I wake up in the morning and go, what am I doing? So <laughs> I, miss, I miss doing traffic. I miss doing it. I miss the joy i took out of finding stuff that nobody else could find right Mm -hmm. yeah well you know you worked with me for years i like to hunt down problems that nobody knows exist and be the first one to do it darby was my traffic reporter on 6 50 a.m here in houston we used to call it the the nifty 650 and he (laughs) would came up with that he came (laughs) up with that he would be at the channel 11 studios and i would be at the radio station and we were we had a connection and i could we had to be at a certain time, and I could hear him running down the hallway. I'm coming! I'm coming! <laughs> okay, I'm here. <sighs> and it, it got to be a gag, only it was for real, you know? Yeah, I would have to do a TV cut away, yeah. And then I'd have to run down the hall into this little closet they had built and put a microphone in and do his traffic for him. And, well, the times would always overlap, yeah. and he'd flip on the microphone. Okay, let's get a look at traffic with Darby. <laughs> Darby, <laughs> well, at least that's what I'm assuming you did because I was in the other that's room. That's exactly going, what well, happened. Well, if you're traveling I-10, the Katy Freeway got an accident here at the tollway, take it up a left lane, and then I go, "Are we done?" And then I'd run down the hall, and then I'd have to do traffic for him out of breath. We go, okay, there's why an accident on I-10. Why couldn't I-10. they have just mic'd you with the thing you had on already and run it through whatever? Oh, sure. Would that have made well, sense? Sure. Yeah, sure they would do that. Okay, well. yeah, but they didn't. It's moot now. The yeah. building's gone. Somebody would have to pay for that. And, you know <laughs> you know how radio stations and TV stations are with money. <laughs> I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, this is an exception in here. This, this is This is a really nice setup else. you got in here. Well, thank you. This is a nice gig. We're glad you're able to come up today. That was my pleasure. Thanks for yeah. having me. You bet. All right. So can I go back to the experts again one more time? Yes, one more time. All right. You got about 60 seconds. So Powell, mm-hmm. when is he going to crash the market? <laughs> We're trying to figure out what he says he wants to normalize rates, and I contend that we don't know what that is. What does that mean? We don't know what that is in this environment. Because we haven't known a normal rate since, what, 2000? That's about right. That's That's about about right. And and like basically September 11th, then rates just went to zero. Yeah. You can just get money for free. Mm -hmm. And we've had one big great monetary experiment that we have been unwinding over time. And now whatever this new normal is going to be, because remember, everybody's, everybody's become over leveraged using these lower rates. We're used to these. And you, you said it earlier, Darby, about interest rates for mortgages being 14%. People go like, gramps. <laughs> well, I'm not paying 14% on them. You know, I mean, they but say they were. To, I know. I I'm, I'm remember. Yeah, I had and, one. But the, but the point is, we can't, we can't handle these kinds of rates. So I don't think... Any of the central banks. I still know. think I still think five percent is low. I mean, what is going to be? What mm-hmm. is normal? You answer that, John. I have no yeah, idea. Yeah, I, I, four to five is usually normal. That's the long term, I think. But who knows when we're going to get oh, there? Again. I, I know that my credit cards are still fourteen to twenty four percent. Oh no, that's, that's still the, like those. Yeah, yeah you're good. How, how only, do you get around those guys? Only twenty four. Yeah. I saw the fine print come through the other day. Twenty seven. 27 to 30. Yeah, it's like, are you kidding me? Yeah, Cut yeah. that thing up. I, I have credit cards, but I, I pay them off every month. Yeah. There you go. Every there month. You go. We talked about it. that the other night. Hey, thanks Use for them. being with us, Darby Douglas. This is my we pleasure. appreciate it. John Camarianos and Richard Rosso. I'm Brent Clanton, the executive producer for the Underbelly Podcast. Catch us on YouTube later this afternoon. Thanks for watching. <laughs>